So like Cynthia said, um, the presentation that we're going to be having today is on the impact of maternal diabetes on fetal development and neonatal care. Try this again. All right, so we'll start out with some definitions. Um, we'll be referring to an IDM that is an infant of a diabetic mother. This is a fetus or infant um, of a gestational diabetic or insulin dependent diabetic woman. Um, GDM will be referred to as well. That is gestational diabetes mellitus. And that is a woman who is um, carbohydrate intolerant. And um, that would be detected first um, during her pregnancy. Um, this does disappear post-pregnancy, but in about 60 out of 100 women with gestational diabetes, um, those 60 out of those 100 will have type 2 diabetes by 10 years after their delivery. So that education um, to our patients is extremely important. The goal for our patients are to be as healthy as possible before becoming pregnant so that they can have the healthiest um, infants and remain healthy to take care of those um, children. Um, patients who have a hard time controlling their blood sugar pre-pregnancy will have an even harder time controlling it when they're pregnant just due to the demands of the baby on their body. Um, so we really stress that education and studies have shown that for every dollar that we spend, um, whether it be hospital education, clinic education, um, that $5.19 is saved. Some statistics. Um, there are 347 million people in the world who have diabetes. Um, diabetes is predicted to become the seventh leading cause of death in the world by the year 2030. Um, the deaths from diabetes are predicted to rise by more than 50% within the next 10 years. Um, over 2 million women of reproductive age currently have diabetes, and we're seeing about a 7% rate um, of pregnancies being affected by diabetes. Poor control during the first trimester contribute to congenital malformations and spontaneous abortions, while poor control in the second and third trimesters um, result mostly in macrosomia. Um, there is a higher incidence compared to non-Hispanic white women of diabetes and pregnancy in the Hispanic and Latina population, and that is a 66% um, higher incidence than white women. The American Indian has a 67% higher incidence of diabetes and pregnancy, and the non-Hispanic black population have a 77% higher incidence in diabetes. Um, so this shows kind of a, um, a higher incidence there in the other cultures compared to the white women. And perinatal mortality is demonstrated to be about 20 out of 1,000 births. This is a slide that I pulled out of the California Maternal Data Center, and it shows California regions. Um, the blue part is focusing on the diabetes mellitus, and the red um, you'll see is the gestational diabetes. And here in San Diego and Imperial Region, um, if we consider that, you know, 7% of the di um, pregnancies are affected di with diabetes, we're seeing an 8.7% rate here and up to 15% incidence up in the Kaiser South region. Um, so there's a lot of high numbers there. Maternal complications. Um, perinatal mortality is at a rate, again, 0.6 to 4.8 percent. Um, women are seeing vision problems, kidney problems, high blood pressure, miscarriage and stillbirth, um, sepsis, premature delivery rates less than 37 weeks are 24 to 33 percent, and our delivery rates at less than 34 weeks due to maternal complications are 15 to 16 percent. 
Um, women are also seeing difficult deliveries, um, shoulder sochas. Um, they're also at a higher risk for cesarean delivery, and the rate that we're seeing for that is actually 32 to 45 percent, which is huge. Um, women are also at a risk for a difficult recovery and also for gum disease, and this information is out of our um, CDAP Preparing for Pregnancy pamphlet, this week's success program, as well as the guidelines for care. The fetal and neonatal complications that we see are diabetic embryopathy, um, which again is related to the poor early control in the first trimester. Um, babies with that are at high risk for renal vein thrombosis, cardiomyopathy. And we're seeing symptomatic rate of between 2 and 10 percent and asymptomatic um, 30 up to 50 percent, as well as skeletal anomalies. Um, and the, these rates are dependent on the severity of the maternal hyperglycemia and the, how well controlled they are. Um, fetopathy, which is again in the second and third trimester, um, the highest rate that we're seeing there is the macrosomia, which is a large infant over 4,500 grams. Intrauterine growth restriction at 2 to 8 percent, so on the other end of the spectrum. Perinatal asphyxia, we're seeing between 9 and 28 percent, and that is including fetal distress, low one-minute APGARs, and interuterine deaths. Hypoglycemia rate in the newborn is 5 to 25 percent of those infants. Hypocalcemia, 4 percent, hypomagnesia, hyperbilirubinemia, and the rates for that are 11 to 29 percent of the births, and polycythemia is 5 to 33 percent. Um, there's also just in general increased risk for um, that child to become diabetic, have heart problems, and to become obese in the future. Some of the delivery complications that we see with a diabetic pregnancy is um, brachial plexus palsy. And I have a picture here that shows that. The fractured clavicle shoulder dystocia and cephalopelvic, cephalopelvic disproportion. Risks that are associated with operative vaginal deliveries are cervical tear, perinatal and vaginal injury, Urinary incontinence, which is up to 47 percent of the women will um, see that. Bowel habit urgency and loss of bowel control. Some of the things that we'll see in the newborn that come from the vaginal deliver operative vaginal deliveries are neonatal and a cranial hemorrhage. One in 664 infants will have that. Subgaleal hematoma retinal hemorrhage, 75% of the infants with a vacuum delivery will have that. A forceps delivery is not um, as often does that occur. Cephalohematoma is more um, common with a vacuum delivery as well, which is 14 to 16%. And those infants are also at an increased risk for jaundice. Perinatal asphyxia is associated with type 1 diabetes. Those infants have fetal heart rate abnormalities, low APGAR scores, and intrauterine death. A study showed that 27 percent of fetuses of diabetic mothers had perinatal asphyxia. Um, that included um, hyperglycemia during labor prematurity, and nephropathy. Here's our little preemies. Um, so these mothers are again at risk for premature delivery. Um, the risk of prematurity in a non-diabetic woman um, in the CDAP guidelines for care is 20 percent. Um, which is much higher in the diabetic woman at 31 percent. 
and one third of these infants that are delivered prematurely are prematurely are delivered because of preeclampsia. Um, now we'll talk a little bit about the intrauterine growth restriction. This occurs in poorly controlled diabetics, especially when the diabetes is complicated by vasculopathy. Um, this also is contributed to an overly excessive um, control of the blood glucose during um, the woman's pregnancy. And preeclampsia impairs the growth by impeding the blood flow and nutrients to the fetus. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the macrosomia and the infants who are large for gestational age. And there's a difference. Um, sometimes those terms are used interchangeably. But um, the term infant who is greater than 4,000 grams is said to be macrosomia. And 20 to 30 percent of infants of diabetic mothers will have macrosomia. Infants whose weight is greater than the 90th percentile for gestational age, um, even if they're premature, they can um, have this, and that would be the large for gestational age babies. And I just have some perinatal outcomes according to birth weight here. And you see with the birth trauma and um, respiratory morbidity is all um, in the higher range for the infants that are greater than 4,500 grams. Respiratory distress sy syndrome occurs more frequently in infants of diabetic mothers. Um, this can occur because of delayed maturation of surfactant synthesis um, that's caused by the hyperinsulinemia. Um, it interferes with the lung maturation by glucocorticoids, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and other cardiac and pulmonary anomalies. We also see the transient kidney of the newborn. Um, in contrast, the pregnancies that are, um, the infants that are stressed out because of the vasculopathy, such as the infants who are um, growth restricted, that can actually cause um, early lung maturation, which is good when we're talking about preeclampsia and infants who have to be delivered prematurely. Um, going on with the transient tachypnea of the newborn, um, this is the most common cause of respiratory distress in the term infant of a diabetic mother. Um, the infant will display tachypnea within the first two hours of life, and this is usually related to the residual lung fluid, which is more common in the infant who is born via C-section. It usually is benign and resolves within a couple of hours. But um, the guidelines do say that this can last up to two days. And again, the cesarean um, burst for macrosomia increase the risk of the newborn having the tachypnea. Um, 